I think within the first five minutes of watching the film, you understand why it needed to be rated R. I would love to hear more about how you got that going. Because I, I remember a few years ago when it was like, oh, Deadpool is going to be rated R and it's going to be crazy. And obviously Warner Brothers is a bit more open to having an R-rated superhero movie, but I really want to hear how it happened for you. Well, it was simple. I, you know, I was writing the screenplay, you know, I had pitched it and I talked to Peter Safran, who's a producer and my manager, and I like, I think this thing's going to be rated R, like... I have to know that they're cool with me writing a rated R script because, and at first I had only committed to writing it. I didn't commit to directing it because I wasn't quite ready to make such a long-term commitment. I said, it's going to be rated R because it's like a war film. And I, I have a real big aversion to like war films or gun films where people are getting shot and it's just like, they're getting thrown back and it's like impact, but no real repercussions to the violence. And so I, I hate that kind of stuff. You know, and I'm like, the only way I can do this and not have it be rated R is if I have them fighting a bunch of robots or something, and I don't want to make a movie with a bunch of robots. I want to make a war film. And so they were like, okay, you can write it rated R. And then, uh, and then when I was finished with it, then I they asked me to direct it, and I said I'll do it under two conditions. They were both conditions they hated. <laughs> One of which was. It needs to be rated R. And the other was which I needed to shoot in Atlanta, Georgia, because my father was dying and he lived in St. Louis and they wanted to shoot in the UK and I couldn't be that far away from my dad. And he passed away a week before shooting. So oh, James, I'm sorry. No, thank you. Uh, thanks. So those were my two conditions. The, the, the UK one was actually the bigger one because okay. that it's a lot more expensive to shoot because of all these tax things and the the United States. Those were my conditions. And they said yes, and they were okay. And they were fantastic. Like they just really let me do my thing. And I think, uh, I think, I hope they're okay now. You know, Joker came out after we were already well into our thing and to shoot and well into shooting. And so that was a really good thing to happen for me. And it took away a little doubt in terms of how well an R-rated movie could perform. You know, obviously something like Joker is, it's like a, this is sort of like a melding of the R-rated things that you see in Joker and you see in Deadpool. Like this stuff hurts, but it's yeah. also incredibly funny. It really works right <laughs> bad I was just it was so nice to be back into a theater and like laughing hysterically right away and also covering my eyes because that can be yeah. a little a little squicky when you were writing it was there like a particular very r-rated bit that you wrote and then take all the way through that you're like yes I love this but this is so rated r for instance king shark ripping a guy in half never seemed like a big deal because it's so over the top right. harley slitting a guy's throat that's like truly hardcore and there was a lot of like questions about, you know, that, like in my mind, again, I think that it's just, it's how it came out. So it worked that way. But when I saw that gag for the first time, I was like, oh my God, that's so, so violent. But I, I you know, I'm like, hey, listen, you, you know, I can risk by not doing something or I can risk by doing something. And I think in this movie, I always chose to risk by doing something. There were things I knew that I didn't want to do, but that was what I did, you know? And then we do other things. Like we see lots of penises, but not not much female nudity, which I think is funny. That's yeah. one of the reasons why we got narrated and was for, for, for that. Well, penises are funny. And it's just like, when you see like a guy just like, who still is uh, like Winnie the Poohing it, you're like, that's funny. Yeah. It's getting <laughs> exactly. funny. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh, that's right. <laughs> He's enjoying the morning sun. Exactly. Oh, bad, bad morning for that guy. Now, obviously that we're seeing the success of these kinds of films, doing an R rating and you're getting back into the Marvel fray, do you think there's any chance that Marvel might do an R rated superhero movie? Um, I, I, I think, I think they will not guardians though, because guardians are family movies. So it's different. It's like, I wouldn't, you know, people are like, finally you were, they let you do R rating. I, what would it, guardians be like, if that was R rated, I'm like, but it's not. Yeah. I could go off and make a Drax movie. That's R rated that I would love to do, you know, like a barbarian Drax, but the guardians movies are, are fables, you know, and I don't, I don't think of them like that. I don't write them like that. They're, it's a different type of movie and you can have some gore and some like, you know, scary darkness in there and things like that, which is good, but it's not, it's not the rock and roll of, you know, Suicide Squad. A few hours ago, I talked to David, which was a wonderful, wonderful pleasure. He just, he's someone who obviously just so much loves his directors. He loves you. And we talked about you, you know, saying, I want you to play Polka Dot Man. And poor David being like, I don't know who that is. Yeah. But 
he said that you had told him that when you were writing the script and there's that line where someone else in the squad says we're all gonna die and he says I hope so and he said that you said that was the line that you most pictured him and he was like I don't know why you'll have to ask him and I was like well I'm talking to him later so well I'll I'll tell you a funny story about David David and I were in Columbia shooting Belco experiment and uh I was producing that movie and he was in it I was you know, sort of seeing this Colombian girl at the time, we were having breakfast one morning and David came up to the table. I'm like, David, because he was walking by on the street. I'm like, come around. And he came in and he sat down and this woman started sobbing because she had a David Desmalchian phobia from, uh, she had seen him in, what was the movie where he played like the, the killer or the child killer or whatever? Prisoners. Yeah, prisoners, right. She had seen prisoners and for some reason had this like weird phobia of him. And I took, I was laughing so hard because I'm taking pictures of like Dave kind of looking at her and her (laughs) sobbing and they're so funny. But uh, there's just something about him that has this like haunted feel at times. And when I wrote that character, I thought of different people that could play him, but I knew that there was nobody that could do that like David, you know? And I, another thing I did with David was one of the times when I really, I, we met each other when we were acting in like this stupid B movie. That's where we first became friends. Uh, I shouldn't say stupid, but in a, in a B movie. But I did a buddy's uh, bachelor party for his bachelor party. We made a video. We redid a scene from the David Lynch movie, uh, Blue Velvet. And it was the singing, it was, it was the, the singing scene. And he was the Kyle... Kyle McLaughlin part and there was something about him on screen I'm like oh my god he looks so cool like he's so interesting to look at as a camera subject that I want to photograph him and so that all those things combined kind of led me to create Polka Dot Man and write the role for him basically. That's so funny Uh, yes I can understand seeing prisoners and then seeing him in real life that yes (laughs) I get that it's probably not as interesting a story but you get another one of your Marvel brethren in here Taika's in here and he's so beautiful and but he's just like a sad clown What's, you know, the process of uh, getting Taika to be in your movie, even for just a couple scenes? I called him. I actually thought about Taika for another role and I offered it to him and he said, I don't know what's, you know, he was working on Akira at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have to give you, you know, my answer in like two weeks. He totally wanted to do it. It was one of the other superheroes. He said that he wanted to do it. And then Akira got greenlit (laughs) and it was happening. time. (laughs) <laughs> and then all of a sudden it fell apart and he wrote me and he said, oh, the fucking movie fell apart. Is that role still available? And I said, no, but let me get you in something else. And so that's when I gave him. Uh, Can you racket. tell me who else you were? Who, what other role? I would feel too bad. I never <laughs> do it unless somebody offers it. Yeah, I get that. Sort of speaking of the the Harley neck slitting, that scene is so bloody and horrific. And like, I don't mind neck slitting. I don't like broken bones. That's where I get. But then at the end of it, it like explodes into like a snow white animated chirping birds, jumping bunnies, Harley's happy. What was the idea behind that scene? Because I love it. And but it's not like anything else in the film. Well, it is sort of like other things in the film, because we go inside of Polka Dot Man's mind at times and we see his stuff. We have titles throughout the movie that are outside of you know, and so I think there is a certain amount that we set up, like the, the rules are not the same as in maybe other movies. You know, even little plot structures, like the way we deal with time right. and things like that are a little bit different. So I think I try to set that up enough that we can go into those places that it's not just out of nowhere. But I think it is uh, very much with, you know, the Harley vision is within her world. And to be able to see the crazy violence with flowers coming out of people's necks was just something that interested me aesthetically. So that scene was a heck of a lot of fun to do. And it was about building a scene, you know, so many action scenes are just like, oh, it's action. And they come around a corner, shoot a bunch of guys and they go around a corner, shoot another bunch of guys. And I always want to build action that actually has a story to the action sequence itself. And it starts out small and it gets bigger and then it goes bigger than we think it's able to go. And so trying to be able to build that story of that action sequence by itself was was part of where it came from as well i promise to save this until after the film is out but i always like talking to directors about post credit scenes if i get a chance to what is up with weasel why is your brother so good at walking and weasel is a child murderer and yet i love him i was very happy for that first one but it's yeah. just like what do you want people to take away about weasel 
Well, you know, there's a lot of people in prison for, for crimes they didn't commit. I'm not sure. Don't you think that if there were 27 kids and Weasel was living on the block, that you're going to blame Weasel? Did he mess? Is he guilty? I think it's a project innocent situation for Weasel, and he he deserves to really have the legal team that he probably did not have the first time through. I mean, he is one step above a greyhound, if that, when it comes to his brain capacity. But yeah, Sean's amazing. It was also cool to make a body that was built in the shape of Sean, so that he was able to do use his body for real. And the noises are like crazy. That Sean. Sean's noises are so funny. All that stuff with him. Those noises are just like, it made me laugh so hard. So he's, just, he was great. I love it. I just, I love Weasel. And I'm happy to hear that maybe he's not a prolific child he might, murderer. He might not be. And so obviously with Peacemaker, the funny thing about uh, Peacemaker is that a couple of weeks ago, I was at an HBO Max event. So I saw the trailer for Peacemaker. So I walked into this in sort of the reverse way that other people will already thinking like oh well you know he's kind of a doofus but he's a hero but most of your viewers are going to have sort of a reverse reaction by the end of the film they're going right. to not like him and then see like oh be reminded he's getting a show so what can they look forward to with peacemaker well i think that's one of the things i think a lot of the characters change a lot in this movie peacemaker he doesn't and if anything he changes for the worse and so being able to go on this adventure with this character who has a lot of true issues, you know, blood sports issues take uh, two hours and 15 minutes to, to deal with. Peacemaker's issues take at least six and a half hours. <laughs> so, so it's about really giving us a glimpse inside this character. But it also is, you know, the Peacemaker show, as people will see, has vibes of all in the family because it really is about his relationship. It's an ensemble movie, an ensemble show, which people don't know, but it is about him. It is about his relationship with Danielle Brooks' character, as well as, you know, Chuck Woody, uh, Awuji's character, and Steve Agee's character, and Jennifer Holland's character. So it's about this team of people and how they each see the world and work together and taking the world's biggest douchebag and finding out how did he become the world's biggest douchebag. James, this is great. The movie made me very happy, which is weird, but I think that that's always what you're going for. So I think you appreciate what I'm saying. Absolutely. I'm happy to see you back and congratulations on everything. I'm just so happy for you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. I really appreciate it. See ya. Bye-bye. Take care.